greater than zero. So there are a few ways to do it. I'm going to draw what we call a sine graph, and we're going to plot the x-intercepts, and we have to worry about vertical asymptote as well. So what are the x-intercepts? So I'll call this r of x. We'll let r of x equal this function. What x values make this 0? There's two of them. 0. No. Oh, 2, negative 2. 2 and negative 2. 0 will make something else 0, but we'll get there in a minute. Minus 2. So just looking at the numerator, 0 equals r of x. That means x equals plus or minus 2. So that's how you make a fraction 0, make the numerator 0. Now there is something happening when x equals 0. What happens when x equals 0? What do we get down there? So we call that vertical asymptote. So undefined, it's not in the domain, it's vertical asymptote. So you have to track vertical asymptotes also. So x equals 0 is important, and negative 2 and positive 2. So those are the three x values that the sign possibly changes on. And now we're going to figure out positive or negative. So I can plug in some values. If I use a blue marker, I could do negative 3, negative 1, positive 1, and 3. Those are the four x values I would use right there. You can also remember back to pre-calculus class and think about end behavior and are we going to cross or bounce on intercepts and our vertical asymptote. So I'm not going to go back through all of graphing in pre-calculus 1 class. You, you can use your calculus skills and see this is going to approach positive 1 half when x is negative, approaching negative infinity or positive infinity. So that minus 4 doesn't matter. So end behavior is approaching positive 1 half on both sides. So to the right of 2 over here, it's going to be positive. And to the left of negative 2, it's also going to be positive. So that came from the end behavior. We did not approach positive infinity, but we approach positive 1 half. So our y values are going to be above the x-axis. So not super positive, but definitely greater than 0. Our x-intercepts are going to be crossing x-intercepts, because if we factor right here, we would have x minus 2, x plus 2. They're both odd degree, so it's going to cross on both of them. You can also plug in x values and figure this out, too. So it's going to go from positive to negative. And over here on this x-intercept, positive 2, it goes from negative to positive. I could check the vertical asymptote. Is our vertical asymptote crossing or bouncing? So it's even, and that means it's going to be bouncing. So it goes, uh, in this case, negative or approaches on the bottom of both sides. So that matches up with the even degree. There's other ways to do it. Plug in four x values and figure out positive or negative. That's another way to do it. You don't need any intuition from pre-calculus 2 class. Pre-calculus 1 class then. So we got our increasing, decreasing. I'm just going to write them down now. Increasing, negative infinity, negative 2, union to infinity. So those are the two positive intervals. And decreasing, we have the two negative intervals right in the middle. So negative 2, 0, union 0, 2. So that's increasing, decreasing. Now we're going to move on to concavity, which is number 6. And we'll look for concave up. Our second derivative, somewhere around here, 4 over x cubed. And I want to know when this is greater than 0. This function 
only has one interesting x value. There's no x-intercepts on this function. I know that because there's no way to make 4 0. Can't pick an x value and turn 4 into a 0. What is the interesting x value? 0. zero. So that's vertical asymptote. So I'm going to draw a sine graph. There's only one thing to worry about. Vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So all I have to decide is positive or negative on the one side, positive or negative on the other. So take a minute right now and decide plus or minus on one side, plus or minus on the other side. You can always use minus one on one. Very quick way right here, plugging in points. If you did end behavior, this is the one end behavior that doesn't help you decide positive or negative because it's approaching zero. It depends on what side we're approaching zero, whether it's positive or negative. So sometimes end behavior doesn't help you out deciding if it's positive or negative. And this is one of those cases. Uh, but you plug in negative and you get negative, positive, you get positive. So negative on the left, positive on the right. So concave up is this positive on the right part. So concave up, zero, infinity, and concave down, negative infinity, zero. So we're ready to sketch the first parts of our graph. So this is plot key stuff. I don't think we found our x-intercepts, x and y-intercepts. So go ahead and find those right now. Our g of x function, x squared plus 4 over 2x. Are there any x-intercepts? Any way to make the numerator 0, if you keep it real? We got real number squared plus 4. It's not going to be 0. The smallest that's ever going to be is 4. So we got no x intercepts. What about y intercepts? What does that 2x mean for y intercepts? And if I plug in 0, I have vertical asymptote where that prevents me from having a y intercept. So I cannot have a y intercept, I have vertical asymptote instead. Yeah. Is that dot key stuff? Plot key. It's like Is it there's one too many E's in there. I, I, I didn't know that was a different word or something. Okay. Plot key stuff. <laughs> I think my K had the loop, an extra loop. All right, so no x-intercepts, no y-intercepts. So all we need to do is plot the critical values vertical asymptote and end behavior. So critical points and behavior and our vertical asymptote. So plot those on a graph right now. So our end behavior, there's nothing past negative 2 and positive.
positive 2. So those are the ends of the interesting parts of the graph. So it's up on the right, down on the left. So from this right here, I'm just going to go, I'll figure out the exact curvature and whatnot later to concavity. But it's generally going to go probably something like that. But I'll connect that part in a minute when we know about concavity. So I want to be a little bit more accurate with our graph. So I'm not going to connect the end behavior yet. And that was a local max and a local min. I think it was like that. So one is local max, smiley face. Or that was local max, and that was local min. So smiley face and frowny face. All right, we are going to use, I'm going to build that table where we combined our increase and decrease in concave up and concave down into one table. So all of our x values are negative 2, 0, and 2. Those are the only ones I need to worry about. And we got f prime and f double prime. So one thing to notice, vertical asymptotes stick around. If you have vertical asymptote, every derivative is going to have the vertical asymptote. Might behave a little different on the two sides. In fact, it will behave differently on the two sides. If uh, you are up, up on your function, your derivative is not going to be up, up. So our derivative has some zeros at 0 and 2 also. So we went increasing negative infinity, negative 2 increasing 2 to infinity. I'm reading off this top line on the board here, just where we're increasing, and decreasing in the middle two intervals. So down to the right, down to the right. And f double prime, that was concavity. So this is smiley face or frowny face, concave up, concave down. So that is all the information about how the curve is changing. So increasing, decreasing, and concave up and down. This is going to help us. Oh, I wish I drew this lower. Perfect. There we go. You can't do that trick. Oh, even better. Put it right below the graph. Oh, amazing. Now the x values are lined up almost perfectly, so I don't have to do too much thinking. Okay. Oh. So your your spidey sense should be going off right now. What's wrong? Concavity is not working out. It's really clear when things are lined up that there's a mistake somewhere. So how can I have a, right here, looks like concave up, but on here it looks like concave down. So where's the mistake? Is it on my graph or is it in my table? Table. So the concavity, I believe, is exactly wrong. So it should be down up. There we go. I just copied it down wrong. Now if you look, there's another chance to check your spidey sense right here. Decreasing, then increasing means your slope had to increase the whole time, or your function was concave up. And something similar on the other side, we go increasing to decreasing, and you're going to be concave down. Now, vertical asymptotes are weird. They don't have that nice property. I go from decreasing to decreasing but that doesn't even mean I have a slope in between. So I had vertical asymptotes. So vertical asymptotes break the spidey sense a little bit. You don't have this nice increasing, decreasing. That means we are concave this way. So vertical asymptotes mess up concavity a little bit. OK. I'm going to go, we'll start on the left and then work our way to the right. So I'm going to start on this left <coughs> local maximum. If I move to the left, the graph basically, just looking at the graph, 
pretty much don't have a choice. Now the question is, does that match the concavity going down, and is my function increasing? It is. So don't look at the arrow going down. This is an increasing func part of the function that I drew. So it's increasing concave down. I think the original curve wasn't so good. This has a little bit better concavity right here. Now going right out of this point, I can't go like this. There's a few reasons. In pre-calculus one class, we realize there's no x-intercept, so that's not possible. But now, I can't even go a little bit that direction. Because in calculus class, we know this function is decreasing, so I can't go up at all. I have to go down or decrease, and I have to be concave downwards. So there's really only one way to, and I have to approach the vertical asymptote. So this function is going to look like this, decreasing, concave down. And we're going to work on the other, start at that local minimum, and go to the left, go to the right, and use the concavity, increasing, decreasing information. This function is also odd. I didn't use that fact before, but this function is odd. So it's going to have rotation symmetry. So go ahead and sketch the right half of this graph using our concavity information, and decreasing, increasing. So we have to approach our vertical asymptote at the top, and the end behavior says we're going up to the right. So this is what your graph looks like. <coughs> so any questions on the graph? All right, everybody's okay with that graph? I could have gotten a little bit more specific about the end behavior somewhere up here. When we did end the end behavior section, our numerator degree is exactly one higher than denominator degree. So this function does go up to the right, down to the left, but more specifically, it goes up to the right and down to the left, and it follows this. It, this is actually a slant asymptote. So it approaches up to the right in this slope right here. So it actually looks like this with a slope of 1 half. And if we want to make our graph extra accurate, which I will give you no additional bonus points for, I'll give you some respect on your final exam if you graph like this or on your take home quiz. Uh, if I want to make my graph more accurate, I'm going to use this information. So I'm supposed to be approaching a y equals 1 half slope. Let me switch to a highlighter here. And do a really quick y equals one half x sketch so I can now I need to come out of this point increase concave up and approach the blue line so I'm really not going to increase that much so it's going to look a lot more like that right there so it's going to bend upwards but only a little bit and really similar approaching left out of here I need to I'm not allowed to go like this because if I do that, I'm going to be decreasing a little bit. So I am going to come out pretty much sideways and then very gradually approach that curve like that. So in today's world, we're never right unless the internet says we're right. So I'm going to go graph this function real fast on foodplot and hopefully it will work out. Full plot, that's probably not where I want to go. Make sure you graph the original, don't graph your derivative, unless you're checking your derivative sign and see if, in the, if that's correct. pretty good. There we go. You can see that local min, local max, and it has the right shape approaching 
the same way. So there we go, that's graphing in a nutshell. That was, if I was more careful with my end behavior, it is true that when x approaches infinity, my function approaches infinity. So it's definitely true. We had that the whole time. But I can get a little more specific about how it approaches infinity because our function is going to behave using the physicist method that plus 4 doesn't matter. So it's going to act a lot like the x over 2 function. So it's going to be very similar to the y equals 1 half x or x over 2 function. So it's going to approach infinity in a manner similar to this line. Likewise, if I had an x squared, if my uh, numerator degree 1 by 2, I would be approaching like an x squared function. So it would look like an x squared function, which we know, we know how those look and approach. Now, x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, they all have not the same graph, but really similar graph. So they all pretty much look like this. The only thing different when you have higher powers your function actually gets steeper more quickly, but it has this general, uh, I would call it polynomial end behavior shape, but I think a lot of people probably want to call it a, a parabola end behavior shape, but gets steeper and steeper basically. So when we lose points, we don't do the exact. No. Slope. Nope. I just want to know is the approach positive or negative infinity or, or a number. So I will. No, I said I would give you extra respect. So if you have extra time and you want to make your graph look more accurate, you can get more specific about your end behavior. So if you tell me you're approaching infinity, good enough. If you tell me how you're approaching infinity, that's good. Your graph will look nicer, but I won't really give you any additional points. So we have really two more things to do. One of them is extreme values. And we're really not going to learn too much more about extreme values. There's only one more theorem. And then we're going to apply it. And then after that, it's applied optimization, which is a lot less bad than it sounds. So we'll do extreme values first. And I'll just keep the notes on the same page. So we've drawn a picture of local max, drawn a picture of local min, so we know what those look like and what properties they have. So ready for the extreme value theorem. So a hypothesis, if f is continuous, So if f is continuous on a b, now it's important that this is closed. So I wrote it as a closed interval, but I'm also going to point an arrow to it and say this is a closed interval. It's important that it's closed. So it's not just an interval, but it's a closed interval. Four point something. It's all in chapter four. You'll see when you do the homeworks, there'll be an extreme value section. There'll be a, I think it, it may not be called graphing. It might be like analyzing and graphing, something like that. Uh, and then there'll be a applied optimization section.
Yep. Uh, maximum and maximum. Oh, yeah. I think I probably mean minimum. So you obtain your extreme values, maximum and minimum, at either a critical point or an end point. And that's the end of the theorem. So what does absolute maximum mean? We'll define that right now. So what way does it make sense for my inequality to go on this definition? So I want the absolute maximum of f of x to be this f of c value, such that for any other x in the interval, I have the biggest y value. So I want the inequality to go this way. So any other x you pick, my y value will be at least as big as the y value corresponding to your x. So any other x out there? It could tie the maximum, but you're not going to beat the maximum, or else the new one would be the maximum. So I got the biggest of all of them around. There is a, a possibility you could have two of the same y values, or you could have the same y value everywhere. So in that case, you could basically pick any of them and say that's the local maximum. So if there's a tie, you just say, well, it's really all about the y value. All right, so that's the absolute maximum. What changes on the absolute minimum? So what changes in definition of the minimum? Yep, so I want f of x to be greater than or equal to my y value. So in this case, we have the smallest y value of all the y values around. So if you notice, all the theorem and these definitions require a closed interval. There's plenty of functions whose domain is not a closed interval. So things get way more tricky if your interval is not closed. So why is a closed interval nice? Well, and closed interval and continuous, why is that really nice? Well, no matter what, you'll have some beginning value and end value, and your function is continuous, so it could get kind of crazy but it can't shoot off to infinity. It can't shoot off to negative infinity because eventually it has to start at a point and end at a point. So it's not going to be able to go to infinity. Unfortunately, there might be a lot of potential maximums you have to check, but there'll be one or hopefully only a few that are tied for the largest value. And there may be a few that you have to check for the minimum, but uh, there won't be hopefully too many. So what happens when things are not closed? Well, we just graphed the function. I'll just do a super fast sketch of that function we graphed. Not the most accurate. What is the maximum y value? Infinity. What's the minimum y value? negative infinity. So if you don't force it to be closed, basically your function can run off towards infinity or negative infinity. And even if I restricted my y value, if I went from negative 3 to 3, so I 
threw out a whole bunch of oops, if I threw out a whole bunch of the function, that's still true. It still has the highest y value infinity and smallest y value negative infinity. So there is no absolute max and min on this function. And that happens with uh, most functions we've looked at. If you allow your interval to be open and you have either vertical asymptotes or it goes to infinity or negative infinity, chances are you won't uh, actually have a maximum or minimum because it will go forever. So most functions we're going to look at are going to be on closed intervals. So we don't have this problem. So on non-closed intervals, functions, I should say function y values can approach plus infinity or minus infinity. So if that happens, you don't have a max or you don't have a min, respectively. And this is no absolute max, no absolute min. So there will be a few homework examples, or a few homework problems that are not on closed intervals. We're going to do one problem not on a closed interval, but on your uh, final exam, if I ask you an extreme value question, it's going to be closed. So I don't want you to have to graph the function, think about what the graph looks like. Uh, I just want you to apply the extreme value theorem. All right, so our first example, and this process is called finding the extrema. Find the extrema of picking an easy function on a closed interval, negative 1 to 3. Now, without doing any real work, I could get the end behavior. If I asked you about this cubic function from negative infinity to infinity, there would be no maximum, no, no absolute max, no absolute min, because it's going to run off to infinity and negative infinity. So I'm intentionally not letting it go to infinity and negative infinity. So we're cutting it off wherever negative 1 and 3 are on the graph. So we're going to be cutting off a bunch of this function. So we're not going to be running towards infinity and negative infinity. Do we have a continuous function? Polynomials are continuous everywhere. So we got a continuous function. And we got a closed interval. That's all we need for the extreme value theorem. So how do we find the maximum minimums? We look at critical points and endpoints. There's two endpoints, and I don't know exactly how many critical points, but it's a polynomial, so it's not going to have too many critical points. So we're going to check all those. So endpoints. We have negative 1, comma, f of negative 1, and 3, comma, f of 3. So you got to figure out those two y values. And then you have to find all critical points. How do we find critical points, given our function f? Set the derivative equal to 0. Just to warn you, if you get a critical point that's not between negative 1 and 3, don't use it. So if you get a critical value, uh, x value of 5, throw it away. So make sure your critical value is inside the interval. I don't want to know about a critical value somewhere else. So find your critical points. You don't need to classify them for this.
So I already checked negative one x value, so you don't have to check it. You're not going to get a new, well, if you use your function correctly, you're not going to get a new y value out of plugging in negative one again, unless you're not dealing with the function. So I already checked the y value associated with negative one up here. So I don't need to find the y value a second time. All right, so what is the biggest y value of the three? So this 318 right here, that's our big winner right there. So this is what we call the maximum, the absolute maximum. What is the smallest of the three y values? Nope, negative two. So down here, this is our absolute minimum. Now I got lazy with my notation on this first, this first point. This equal sign says a point equals a number. That doesn't make any sense. <coughs> so I will mean what you know if you write this, but what I really meant was all this stuff right here is f of negative one. So that would be correct. That's all f of negative one computation right there. And positive two was not a minimum or was not the biggest or the smallest. So if I classify, or no, that's, that's not a, that's an endpoint. So it's not even necessarily a critical point. Well, it does. It is a critical point, but we've already found the biggest and the smallest. So the, all the other ones are in between. Why does the extreme value theorem not apply on this example? So there's only really two things I needed for the extreme value theorem. A continuous function, closed interval. So which one do I not have? Closed interval. Closed interval. We've got nice, we got polynomial, continuous function, no problem, but my interval's not closed. So on a problem you're not allowed to apply the extreme value theorem, I recommend just basically graph it and use your intuition. Because this is going to run off to infinity in one direction, and you just need to know which is it going to go, uh, the y value going to increase in that direction or decrease. If you have a weird rational function, things get even stranger. So what I'm going to do is just sketch a really fast graph, x squared function. That's not the best parabola. There we go. We're not going to uh, negative infinity on the left because we're stopping at negative one. So our graph's gonna look about like this. Is there a maximum, an absolute maximum here? Nope. So if you say, oh, well, what about maybe uh, whatever point this is, 100 comma 100 squared, that's a pretty good uh, y value. You just got to go a little more to the right, and you'll find a way bigger y value than that. So anyone you try to pick, it's easy to find a bigger one. So absolute max is out. What about absolute min? So this minimum is fine because we don't go past, we never drop below zero. So we got an absolute min at zero, zero. And it was this y value zero that made it the minimum. That's what made it the minim minimum. We could look for local. And there could be more than one local max. So there could be maxes. And there could be more than one local minimum. So is there a local maximum? Is there a point on this graph such that all the other points close by, their y values are smaller than or equal to. So if I look at this point, other points close by, do they have a bigger y value? So this is a local maximum right here. 
even though it doesn't have a uh, horizontal slope. So that is a local max, even though it's not a critical point. Is there a local minimum? Is there a point such that other points close by have bigger y values? Or another way to say it, is there a valley? Yep, zero, zero. So generally, your, if you have an absolute max or min, it also is a max or min locally. So if it's the biggest one around, it's got to be the biggest one close by as well. So if you got an absolute, you have a local, but the opposite is not true. So you may have a local max like this guy, but as soon as you zoom out far enough, you see, oh, there's way bigger points than that. I think they call it big fish in a small pond. So you're the local max, but then you realize <coughs> when you leave the pond, there's way bigger y values. Let's do the mean value theorem first. Did we talk about that already? I don't think we did. So we'll write down the mean value theorem. And we'll save optimization until Monday. So the mean value theorem, when you see the word mean, if you're in a math class, that means average. So our mean value theorem, which I don't have written down anywhere. Oh, here we go. It's on this paper. So I want to make sure I have the hypothesis right. So if f is continuous on AB and diffable on the open interval AB, then there exists C in the open interval AB such that F prime of C equals FB minus FA divided by B minus A. That is the mean value theorem. It's a lot like the intermediate value theorem. What are the differences? Intermediate value theorem had no derivatives in it, so it didn't have differentiable. And intermediate value theorem, it did have, it did say there's an x value that has a y value between the other two y values. So it looked similar, but it's definitely not the same. What is this fb minus fa over b minus a? What did we call that about two months ago? rate of change, and this is the average rate of change. If I take a limit where b goes to a or a goes to b, if this gets super small, then this is the derivative of the slope or the instantaneous rate of change. But overall, this is what we call the average rate of change. So what is the intuition behind the theorem? You have some function that is continuous. Most functions I give you are going to be differentiable on the closed interval AB. But just in case your function doesn't have to be differentiable on the bounds, on the actual endpoints, it just needs to be differentiable in the middle. All right, average rate of change. We did plenty of these graphs, examples. It's basically the slope between those two points. That's the average rate of change. And what is the intermediate? or the mean value theorem tell us there is an x value such that the slope at some x value is the same as the average rate of change. So there is one x value right here that looks like it has the same slope as average rate of change. Is there another x value that looks like it has the same slope? Yeah, somewhere down here. Now if you're really into geometry, there is a neat geometric fact 
you don't need to write the blue stuff down, but you'll be perpendicular like that, and you can. There are other ways aside from, there are ways geometrically to find that point. But if you're not so into geometry, this is all you need to know right here. So we'll do one example from this, and then we'll do spend the rest of the time doing some uh, optimization problems. <coughs>